Thank you so much. Um, I am done with my uh, uh, position as a journalist about uh, 10 years ago. It's still haunting me though. Uh, but um, uh, I, if I was to be journalist, I couldn't express some of the positions that I want to express. So. Uh, let me start with this one. Uh, there is a number of assumptions that uh, we have employed uh, to assist us to understand the former Soviet Union. And these assumptions over the years, um, in many cases, have proven to be wrong. Um, it's not to say that the, world, that the West has done a lousy job of trying to understand the post-Soviet countries. In many cases, it could not have done a better job than it did, because simply a lot of data was not available at the very rapid split of the Soviet Union, uh, because very often many of the events could not be foreseen simply for the reason that um, the indicators were not available, and there was no sufficient experience uh, that would uh, assist in uh, projecting the possible scenarios for the future. However, now we have 25 years since the fall of Berlin Wall, and we have some information to reflect upon. And we have uh, very clear parallels in history, and we have uh, much more data now than we had in 1991, when uh, the events were developing so fast that many of the observers could not simply follow them. Um, it's, it, may sound diff it may sound strange, but I would remind uh, us the speech of the then President of the United States, um, George Bush, who arrived to the Ukrainian parliament three weeks prior to uh, the Ukraine declaring its independence, urging not to do this. And uh, this is exactly the situation uh, when the world leaders were behind the world events. Let's try to look at the situation from a uh, helicopter, uh, you know, employing the helicopter view from, from a larger perspective. We understand that Putin himself is not a cause of the problems. He is stirring a lot of things, he's making a lot of decisions, but he is actually an effect of Stalinism not being persecuted similarly to how Nazism was persecuted after the Second World War. And uh, basically the revival of the same totalitarian position is a very uh, understandable situation, a very understandable circumstance. So if Putin is to go quickly under the sanctions, what we actually may get is we may get a worse situation, not a better situation, because what will happen is that we will take out the symptom without healing the illness. So we have to understand that the process of transformation that we stand in front is much longer, much more difficult, and much more painful than it may seem. And uh, we may actually try to simplify this to, to Putin's policies, Kremlin's policies, but we should understand that there is a genuine support in Russian society of the currently employed policies, even if we exclude the factor of propaganda. And this is, and this is, and this is a result of Russia not being de-Sovietized and uh, separating Russian from Soviet is a very sophisticated task that we would have to go through. Well, my question is whether the EU is fit for the job to either do this or assist in doing this. In my, in my understanding, partially yes. The EU has superb capacity in analysis, in academia, the EU has resources, the EU has uh, enormous interest in having its own security, from going from specific security in energy to general security uh, in broad context. But at the same time, there are missing bits of um, the formula where the countries of the um, um, 
uh, neighborhood uh, uh, EU neighborhood EU neighbors can contribute. I am very wrong. I am very often faced with the assumption that I consider to be wrong that Ukrainian and Russian cultures are so close that um, uh, it's easier for Ukraine uh, to 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 uh, interpret Russia. Actually, Ukrainian and Russian political cultures are very different. Russian political culture is about concentration of authority, it's about verticals, Ukrainian political culture is very Mediterranean. It's rather resembling the Greek or the southern Italian political culture than resembling Russian political culture. So, <clears throat> and hence we have very different types of problems with institution building. It's much easier to build institutions in Russia than to build institutions in Ukraine, though, though, though the institutions in Russia that are built we will probably not like in the future. Thus, relationship between Ukraine and Russia, I would rather describe as a very unhappy marriage with a history of violence, where the spouses are not similar but where one spouse actually learned the hard way to understand the other spouse. And what Ukraine can help is Ukraine can actually provide the missing bits of information in understanding exactly what the current Kremlin ways are and how to counteract them. Is Ukraine capable to do it itself? No, it's not. As we said, it doesn't have sufficient governance, it doesn't have sufficient analytical ability, it doesn't have many other um, uh, ingredients that are, that are necessary. So we have a clear situation of synergy for the first time in maybe 25 years where Ukraine has something to bring to the table and Europe has something, the European Union has something to bring to the table and together we can actually start thinking on a comprehensive long-term policy towards Russia. And when I say towards Russia, and when I say Ukraine, I am definitely very much generalizing, because we will probably have to deal with something more, sophistic more sophisticated and something larger. Let's look at the neighborhood um, uh, countries. Let's look at Belarus. Um, we understand Belarus from the institutional perspective. We understand that Belarus is a dictatorship, we understand the role of Lukashenko, we understand where the opposition is. But what do we know about Belarusian political culture? Let's imagine that Lukashenko vanishes for whatever reason. Heart attack maybe? You know, change of heart in Moscow? What do we know, how would Belarusians react? You know, what do we understand about the way countries can develop in the region of the Ca of Caucasus. What do we understand about uh, Moldova? What do we understand about Ukraine and its different parts? And let me go further and in more sophisticated way. Taken that it will be very difficult for Russia, which will be undergoing any kind of transformation that would make it freer, to stay within its own borders. What do we know about parts of Russia that are likely not to stay within Russia should events start happening. What do we know about Dagestan? What do we know about Tatarstan? What do we know about Western Siberia? What do we know about uh, um, uh, Karelia? What do we know about, uh, you know, Khante, Yakutia, and, you know, the, all the way to Khabarovsky Krai? It's not for granted that, you know, Russia will split into many pieces. But we've been there, haven't we? In 1989, it looked very unlikely that the Soviet Union would collapse. In 2014, it is quite unlikely that the world map will be very different uh, just several months or several years from now than it is right now. But it may be. So, basically right now, the neighborhood policy of the of EU is gaining new sense and when we're trying to judge it based, based on the previous perceptions we're basically coming to the point where we are cutting the opportunities for ourselves in the future. These countries are so diverse, their problems are so different, 
they represent such different cultures that it would be extremely beneficial for the EU to actually learn to deal with these differences because these differences are just the overture to the future transformations of very different countries in Asia, in Africa, and Latin America, and you name it, you know, in other areas of the world. Pretty much Ukraine, Ukraine's neighbors and Russia will be a huge, at the same time, um, transformation task, but also a place where the EU can learn to do two things. First, to learn to deal with transformation, and we understand that the EU has been in the last 50 years basically a synonym, a synonym to resilience and sophistication. And this is what EU has become, a very sophisticated system, very smart system. We may not like its efficiency always, but it is really as, probably as sophisticated mechanism as it, as it goes in the world. And the challenges will be only arising. So the EU has really the opportunity to become even, even more updated, even more sophisticated. And the other thing, it, has the, it opens the opportunity to improve security before we will go through the next round, go through the next circle, and before we will have to face the challenge of China directly 10, 15, 20, 25 years from now, but we will have to do it sooner or later. Thank you.